Hello, and welcome to the Stop Devaluation Podcast. I'm your host and founder of the Stop Devaluation Movement, Melody Hilton. The heart of this movement is to see the value in all of humanity and live courageous lifestyles of using our power for good instead of harm. We can affect change by choosing validation over judgment, and I hope you'll take your place and make a positive impact in this world. Power is embodied in every form of authority and leadership responsibility. It could be a parent, a guardian, an educator, governmental leader, employer, spiritual leader, or performer. When that power is used for good, these platforms of power demonstrate justice. However, when there is an abuse of that power, injustice is propagated, damaging lives and producing emotional suffering. Abuse of power begins in the poisoned and corrupt motives of the abuser. Some actions may appear crueler than others, but to the one being taken advantage of, it is hurtful, conflict-ridden, and unjust. Today's episode reveals the grooming of a young person to cause them to think and believe the actions of their leaders was love-based when in actuality, it was one of the highest levels of abuse of leadership, influence, and power. I am so excited today to introduce you to an amazing young man. He's an assistant vice president in the nation's number one lending institution, but he's also an amazing husband and father. And so today I want to introduce you to Harold Williams. Welcome, Harold. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. I am excited for you to share your story because to be very honest, some of the things that you have gone through, so many people can never relate or connect to, but if they can relate to it, they often hold it as a secret on the inside of them. Could you start with some of the things that brought a devaluation to you or a place of shame or a place of pain, even when you were young growing up? Absolutely. I can actually remember back in elementary school, actually starting out in elementary school, um, I went to a predominantly white school. There may have been maybe three or four African-American children in the whole school. Mm. Uh, And then from there, just, you know, dealing with, you know, the bullying and name calling because I looked different than everyone else. You know, I, you know, I had that, of course, the the dark skin versus everyone else. And then, I mean, it was actually sad to to actually experience, you know, that that terrible N-word that we all know um, that even children used out on the playground, you know, when they would uh, play with me or didn't want to play with me, they would say no, because you are, you know, that word, that N word. Mm. Um, I also remember specifically being invited to birthday parties, you know, by some, some of the students. And even, you know, when you show up at the birthday party, even the parents were a little taken because they didn't know that, <laughs> you know, that their child was a friend a friend of an African-American uh, child mm-hmm. or boy, you know, so just being able to, to notice that or, or recognize that I was different, you know, and that, um, you know, that kind of carved me out to be a person that always felt rejected, always felt like I didn't fit in. Mm. And, you know, from there, you know, I, I just feel like I went through, you know, just life, not, feeling important because of who I was. So did you do different things to strive to be accepted, to be valued, to feel important? Oh, absolutely. When I think about it, I actually dealt with a lot of behavioral things in elementary school, you know, where I would act out Mm -hmm. in school um, to really get attention, you know, Mm -hmm. to get people to laugh at me, you know, in a different way. Like they're not making fun of me. They're actually laughing with me, you could say, or laughing at me, you know, because I'm, you know, 
becoming more popular by acting out. I really dealt with a lot of behavioral things um, in and out of the principal's office. And again, this is all in elementary school Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where, you know, my, even my parents were concerned or my grandparents rather uh, were very concerned, like, you know, what's going on with you because you're quiet, you know, you've always been well behaved again, because I wanted that, that validation. I wanted to feel like, you know, everyone liked me. You know, so I would I would do those type of things to get people's attention. So how did that affect you in your high school years and your young, your young early 20s? Um, I think, to be honest, I think it, it, it followed me um, to the point where even as a, a as a teenager, you know, I was still looking for that validation. I was still looking for people to like me. And in order for someone to like me, I felt like I had to shift myself, you know, and, you know, kind of fell into that peer pressure and and fell into, you know, all kinds of things just, again, so people would say, wow, you know, Harold's great. You know, we we like him and let's hang out with him. And (laughs) as I got into high school, I actually shifted from, you know, the predominantly white um, school to now a predominantly black school. Uh, at that point, then I felt like I didn't fit in because uh, everyone was black, you know, and uh, then there was, I kind of went through a phase where people didn't feel like I was black enough. (laughs) So, uh, you know, I kind of continued to, again, try to get that validation through friends friends and and whatnot, Um, even to the point where even family, you know, was a little different towards me because, you know, my grandparents raised me out in the, what we call the country. Uh, and now where I was at and where most of my family lived at was out in the city. So they felt like that we felt that we were better um, because we were out, you know, out there. Wow. So it, it, it was just like a, felt like it was just like my life was set up to be rejected. You know, mm-hmm. like it's like wherever I went, it's like rejection followed me. Wow. Did that position you to where you felt like you had to live your life uh, to please others so you would be accepted? Absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, even from relationships and, you know, friendships, uh, even to the point of even if I could be specific or be honest, even, you know, with with job life or career it was like I had to not be my unique self but try to be someone else so that I would be again accepted you know so fast forwarding all the way to uh career you know of course as you stated you know assistant vice president but for a while I was trying to look and speak and do like all those that you know, with that were around me, so that again I wouldn't be casted out, or mm. you know, you're not good enough. Uh, again, to be in the organization that I'm a part of, you know, it's it's you see where again it's like back to elementary school where it's a predominantly you know white, <laughs> uh, older male um, positions like the position I'm in is normally where it's an older white male that would sit in that position. Um, but I had mentors and people actually in the marketplace that really encouraged me to be who I was. It's like, yep, we understand that you are a black male. Uh, we believe, we actually see that you are, you know, young, you're a millennial. Uh, but, we need someone like you at the table, you know? And and when I started to hear that, it imparted so much, um, I don't even know the word. It was like so much excitement. Uh, I felt that again, that acceptance and it wasn't a false acceptance or it wasn't a, you know, you got to do this to be this, you know, it was just like, be yourself. Yeah. And as you be yourself, you'll be able to excel. I've really taken that on um, these last few years. You know, and I believe that's why many doors have opened because I've just decided to be me. And so really that has been a healing balm in your life for you just to be who you are in your sphere of influence and have that celebrated. 
Yes, absolutely. It wasn't always that way for you, was it? No, absolutely not. Could you tell me about some leaders that were in your life where you you so desired to please them, but in actuality, they were grooming you to abuse their power to take from you? Yeah, I mean, I just, um, being a part of several different organizations and, and whatnot, um, you know, there was this thing where in order to excel, you have to be who we want you to be and Mm -hmm. you have to do what we tell you to do. And if you don't do it, then we will reject you. We're going to push you out or they would kind of speak, you know, against you and say, well, if you don't do it, then, you know, just accept or expect for nothing good to come out of you. Um, You know, so that was kind of hard uh, to recognize. And, And I did go through seasons where I was, Again, probably from that little boy in elementary school looking for that validation, yeah. um, even as a, as, a, as a grown man, <laughs> you know, still finding, trying to find maturity and different things like that. You know, I, I often could see the little boy that kept, you know, that was dealing with those emotional things even in my 20s and even in my early 30s. Um, it, it was tough, you know, to, again, in order to be someone of importance, you had to do X, Y, and Z. And a lot of times that X, Y, and Z were things that were very, you know, like you said, abuse of power, um, manipulation, and control. And, you know, you begin to walk actually in a, not just, um, well, I'll say it like this, you begin to really walk into a fear mm-hmm. of rejection. You know, like I, I'm fearing if I don't do this, then I'll be rejected. Right. If I don't do this, then I'm not going to excel in these organizations. So I began to, you know, uh, what they say, what, uh, drink the Kool-Aid, you know, or drink mm-hmm. the juice and just began to do things that totally even contradicted my character um, again so that I could so that I could also be a person of power. Mm. And I recognized that that power was not being used for good. You know, it was actually, uh, it was power to make me feel good. It was power to stroke my ego. You know, it was all this stuff that, again, to make me feel accepted and make me feel important. So in a sense, you felt personally powerless. So when a person Mm -hmm. of power gave you an opportunity to please them, it made you feel powerful when in actuality, it was an abuse of their power harming you in even a greater measure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, just going through certain things really caused more, I'll be honest, depression, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just some mental situations and issues. you know, just hurt. Um, I actually became suicidal for, for, you know, for a while, you know, again, because you're looking at people that have power, but you're also looking not just to get their power, but even more so just to connect because that, I think that that was the longing again of that little boy. Mm. I just want to connect with people, you know, and I want to connect and I want to connect in a good way. But, you know, I noticed that again, these people with this power were utilizing it in the wrong, in the wrong sense. So therefore it actually left me more broken yeah. than that elementary boy. So all their power against you was for their good, for their pleasure and actually stole from you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like, you know, how people use the, the term, like, I feel like I sold my soul, mm-hmm. you know, or sold who I was, uh, again, just to be somebody. And at the end of the day, you know, I've now learned that being somebody has nothing to do with what others can do for you, Mm -hmm. but it's more so how you feel about yourself and knowing who you are and, and really recognizing your true identity. Well, one thing that I think we've seen in recent history is where individuals have been exposed for taking advantage of those that felt like they needed them to be successful. They were groomed to function in ways that 
caused them fear, devalued them, dehumanized them, and really positioned them that they might have looked successful externally, but inside they were broken and wounded. Yeah, that's that's the truth. And I, I'm one of those folks. I'm one of those people. You Absolutely. were one of those people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that truth. But yes, yeah, that's I'm, right. <laughs> Tell me, uh, Harold, uh, when when you began to get understanding of what was really happening to you, that you had, quote unquote, drunk the Kool-Aid and uh, that they really didn't value, they really were not wanting to see you succeed, uh, but they wanted to have power over you. What were some of the things that took place in your life or relationships or individuals that you met that saw your value and your worth and your potential for the uniqueness of who you were without a desire to take advantage of you? If I could use one example, it would be actually yourself and and your husband. When I first met you and your husband, you know, it was so important I feel like you all really drove um, a message of validation as you're still doing today, you know, and really knowing your worth and also recognizing that what you do does not make you. It's, it's who you are that makes you. And, you know, so it was just really understanding that, you know, what I can offer doesn't necessarily um, bring that validation, but what I have inside of me, like yeah. a peace of mind and, you know, just being excited about who I am as a person was so important. You know, so when I, when I met you, you know, it was, it was always about how are you as a person, not how are you as your giftings and, you know, what you can offer you know, the marketplace and, you know, different things like that. But it was, how are you? How are you emotionally? How are you, you know, mentally? And we'd be, you know, we really went through some seasons where it was just a lot of mentoring sessions mm -hmm. and a lot of deprogramming of, of the old mindsets and the old understanding of who I was and really accepting really who I was and really seeing it for what it was. Well, I wasn't I expecting that. you to bring me into this, uh, but <laughs> now that you have, you know, I want to let our audience really recognize that this young man connected uh, to me when he was very broken and uh, he did not know how to, even though you were a grown man, it was so difficult for you to make decisions separate from a person in authority because you had been so taken advantage of. And I remember uh, some of our conversations, I would say, buddy, you have to make this decision because if uh, you have to obey me. You better run from me because that would be an abuse of authority. And yeah. so um, it was just such an honor to be able to see how step by step just just validating that you held power, the power of choice, and that yeah. uh, you were not to be controlled, you were not to be manipulated, that that was not acceptable, that really you began to find your voice. And in actuality, you've written a book. And what's the name of that book, Harold? Yes, yeah, it's uh, Dancing with Wolves. Yeah, you were dancing with wolves. <laughs> and um, so now you have used writing that book and you're using your voice to empower others to see their values, see their worth, and to come out of those things that are abuse of authority and rise up and be confident in who they are as an individual and to make decisions for their life so that they can walk in success and discover their voice, their message, uh, and their opportunity to be personally successful. Yeah, absolutely. I know how you're generating value in others through your book and in different ways, but you are a VP in an organization. Uh, how do you generate value there? Absolutely. Within my role, of course, I have the opportunity to, you know, actually mentor um, a, few a few people, which is 
always exciting because you get a chance to see their makeup. You actually get to see some of their areas or lack thereof of confidence. I'm able to actually say, hey, you know, you're operating in fear when you said that statement or, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of suppressing who you are um, to get, again, the acceptance of others. So I, I'm able to actually do mentoring within our uh, organization. Um, I've also been currently selected or recently selected rather um, to be a part of a diversity leadership program where I'm co-leading it. Um, you know, so this will be exciting because it will be about 50 individuals that we get to spend the next year pouring into. Wow. You know, so we, we are actually, you know, looking at curriculum and, and, um, and you know, stuff that we can instill in them, you know, and it'll be stuff like presentation skills and stuff like that. But even in that, being able to say, you know, you're, you kind of suppress your own individual individuality to sound like this person who presents, just really being able to leverage. And I do, you know, really leverage uh, those opportunities that have been given to me to really speak into people's lives. And then, as you said, with the book that I've written, I've also been able to uh, speak at conferences and different gatherings for people to actually identify power being used um, not in the right way. Harold, you are a man who has learned that leadership is not about position, it's not about title, but it's about the opportunity to influence others and use your power for their good. It's very fulfilling and it's very freeing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and you get to be you. <laughs> Get to be me. And, and one thing that's powerful too, you are able to recognize almost immediately the abuse of power and you Absolutely. simply make a choice not to respond to that. Absolutely. So you're creating a safe environment in the workplace. Yeah. And yeah. I know yeah. you've created a safe environment in your home and with your children. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all the things that were destructive to your identity, to your purpose, to your self-worth literally have turned around that have now become tools in your tool belt so that you can model what is healthy, what is pure, and what is good. Yeah. And that's actually one thing I wanted to say is out of all of that, I've learned not to just talk about, talk about it, but actually be about it and actually model it in every aspect of life. You know, so in my marriage, you know, I don't dictate what my wife does. You know, I, you know, in my children, I don't, you know, I'm not that overbearing father, you know, and even in the marketplace, you know, I have an opportunity to, to be, again, be me, but show them, you know, that they can be themselves as well. So it's awesome. And one thing about you that I have learned through the years is that you stand in a place of confidence in who you are. I love you to the moon and back, buddy. I love you as well. Thank you so much for joining me on my story and sharing uh, the intimacy, the challenges of your past, but also the victories of your present. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I want to thank you for listening and encourage you to become a part of the Stop Devaluation Movement. Be sure to like and follow hashtag Stop Devaluation on social media, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and visit StopDevaluation.com for more information and free resources. You can help spread the movement by sharing with others, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, and most of all, by living a courageous lifestyle of using your power for good. Go out and value someone today. Your life matters and you can make the world a better place. One word, one choice, one action of validation at a time. <laughs>